Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, June 14th, 2012. Here's a quick look at what we have lined up for you this evening. Tonight, it's the rise of the spy drones as the FAA predicts 30,000 drones in operation in U.S. skies by 2020. Then, the U.S. expansion of secret intelligence operations in Africa unfolds. Plus, a special report on the hidden dangers of nuclear technology. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. All that and more coming up during the next 30 minutes or so, but first, let's jump right into our top headlines as we begin this evening with a report from the Washington Post as the U.S. expands secret intelligence operations in Africa. They are establishing a network of air bases to spy on terrorists. That's right, just terrorists. The operations have intensified in recent months as this is part of the growing shadow war against al-Qaeda affiliates, more like al qaeda affiliates and other militant groups. The surveillance is overseen by U.S. Special Operations Forces and private military contractors. No big surprise there. And of course, they are also there to train the African troops. And now they have spy drones to track down the boogeyman Kony, the infamous fugitive leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. So the militarization of Africa under the Obama administration escalates and expands throughout the continent. No big surprise there. I guess we didn't see that one coming, right? Now, uh, speaking of drones, a U.S. congressman is demanding justification for U.S. drone strikes. In fact, 26 congressmen sent a letter to Barack Obama demanding a legal justification for the drone strikes. This was led by Congressman Dennis Kucinich, who says that the drone strikes could significantly increase risk of killing innocent civilians and those with no relationship to a potential attack on the U.S. Well, no kidding. The U.S. always says that they only target militants, but we all know by reading reports that the majority of people who get killed in these drone strikes are indeed civilians. That includes men, women, and children. Well, the move toward a cashless society has taken root in India, as smart cards have been introduced by none other than the World Bank is to replace their cash system and help workers save money. The project has been going on since 2008. It requires fingerprint scans of all 10 fingers. This could very well be the prototype for the total cashless control grid that the globalists have been planning worldwide. And as you know, a couple weeks ago, back in Chantilly, Virginia, at the Bilderberg meeting, there was a, a couple that were paired up there. One was the head of the European Union's Digital Agenda Administrator, is her uh, title. That's Neely Crows. She was paired up with General Keith Alexander, and he's the head of the NSA and U.S. Cybercom. Together, they are developing ways to establish a mandatory electronic ID system, and this, and, uh, of course, this is in the name of Internet security and safe commerce. So we have smart cards in India, no cash required. And soon in the U.S. and Europe, we have this mandatory electronic ID system. And this is their way to slowly implement the total cashless society control grid here. And it's also one step closer to, well, I'll just go ahead and say it. It's uh, one step closer to the Mark of the Beast system. Now... We have an InfoWars exclusive report uncovering the nuclear secrets of Austin, Texas, as dangerous experimentations in the continuity of government threatens our very way of life. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. From before the days of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the military-industrial complex has dominated research at universities across the United States. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific 
technological elite in laboratories and testing fields. The free university, university has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. There have been many disasters. In California in 1959, a large sodium reactor melted down, and many estimates show that it was over 70 times bigger than Three Mile Island and similar in effect to Chernobyl. But Americans weren't told about it for decades later. The reactor problem in July of 1959 involved partial core meltdown was not publicly acknowledged until decades later. That's why it's important to look at all the secret and covert infrastructure across the United States including Austin, Texas, the site of three different covert nuclear reactors and reports of huge caches of radioactive waste being hidden in the community of Austin, Texas. This is similar to large stockpiles that have been found in California and other states. No one wants the waste in their community, so government universities tend to hide it. Alex Jones here with a breaking first report on the underground infrastructure that literally infest Austin, Texas and surrounding areas. Bioweapons, rail guns, secret cyclotron facilities exploding just a few days ago, and big underground nuclear plants, research facilities, uh, some of the biggest research facilities in the country, right here in Austin, and almost no newspaper articles about it. The articles we found online by the statesman and others have been removed. Wikipedia has had the record of it expunged. But my father, when he was going to the University of Texas in the late 60s and was in departments that had access to the downtown reactor, saw it himself, worked on it uh, as part of his physics class. Then in the late 80s, they built new larger reactors in North Austin. We're going to show you both of those. But in our investigation of these secretive infrastructures the Department of Defense is controlling right here in Austin, but also in many other cities around the country, we discovered that hiding right under our nose, our own Chris Odin's great-grandfather had been the head superintendent of all the facilities for the University of Texas in Austin, the biggest campus in the world, and that up until 1970 when he retired, he told his great-grandson and family, for that matter, that the huge underground cave system right outside Austin had been used as a secret dumping ground. So, Chris, uh, here in our office, uh, tell folks exactly what your grandfather told you that they stored in there and uh, how big this cave system is. My great-grandfather, Benny Ellis, uh, had told me many times about a, um, a site on the western portion of Austin, uh, what used to be the um, outside of the city limits, uh, right off of Redbud Trail. Um, I'd say just a couple of hundred yards south of where the dam is at the beginning of the old town lake, Lady Bird Lake, whatever they call it. And uh, he told me uh, for, for many years they had dumped uh, barrels of chemical waste, um, heavy chests and containers of metal waste that he knew to be radioactive. Um, he described them as containers with biohazard labels, um, radioactive labels. Um, he had had the uh, responsibility of controlling transportation, and so in many cases, uh, he was witness to such events. And you uh, said that your great-grandfather said that they would wall it off and that, and that there were areas that were cemented, so they would put it back in crevices. Over the years, even when looking at the, uh, the cave entrance site, there are layers that are comprised of older concrete. You can see it's pitted and has aged, and then... Uh, there have been newer installations where it's more polished, updated concrete. They've even disguised, or what I consider disguised, a portion of it as drainage for the entrance that goes underneath the cliff that's near it. This is a big deal because we have this history, not just here, but in Russia, Japan, where they just store this stuff all over the place. They store it in warehouses illegally. Uh, repeat what you told me on the radio earlier today uh, about the fact that they started moving it out to Redbud because it had been in East Austin. Uh, yes, according to him, for many years they had been attempting to store uh, wastes of many kinds, uh, dumping wastes of many kinds, as, as well as uh, simply storing um, heavy equipment used by the university out where what is today Dishfalk Field, it's a, a large baseball diamond. Um, that part of Austin uh, was East Austin, typically known for having a higher minority population. Uh, there was a lot of blowback from the community. And they, in turn, began to store it underground uh, in those lesser-known facilities. 
hey, this is stored in the richest part of Austin now. It was not at that time. It was uh, city limits. There, there were, was very little development. It was, uh, it was country. It was at that time. No, I've got friends that live out there, and there's old fishing shacks and things from the 30s and 40s, and that's all that was out there. Right. I mean, that was the countryside. Exactly. Now, before we get into the full report, that's just part one, because this just started developing yesterday. What's your overall view? And did your great grandfather, who was the uh, head of uh, superintendent of facilities at UT for all those years, did you ever talk about the reactor underneath the presidential library? He did describe um, what many had said was underneath the uh, Robert Lee Memorial Building. Um, he said that. Uh, there was more activity going on under the ground than above the ground. Um, the campus was uh, enormous, and the tunnels were vast. Um, they were able to do things like transfer library books from one building to another underground when weather wouldn't permit. Um, he even described uh, times when personnel would use underground corridors instead of traveling Above ground. And it's not just Austin, Texas. There is secret infrastructure in every major city. But even my grandfather and family that lived here in Austin talked about the old SAC base that's now our international airport, Bergstrom. And they admit that the Hilton Hotel out there is the big SAC command building. Was that. And I've talked to family who's currently in the military who says, well, we can't talk about it. But yes, there's a big underground base there. There's railways connected to UT, the Capitol, and all the way out to Fort Hood, 60 miles away. I mean, it's amazing. The United States has spent more money than all other countries combined on defense, but also on COG, continuity of government. Can you imagine how big these underground bases are? I mean, it, I've been told it's just staggering, the whole giant secret government corporate infrastructure that's underground. Despite the bedrock here, despite the manpower that would go into such a thing, I, I know I've been told of... Uh, underground bases, even located at the Capitol, that were installed during the Cold War simply for uh, bomb shelters. Chris Oden, thank you for taking time out to talk with us today. We're going to get into the full report right now from you guys on the street yesterday, Aaron Dykes, yourself, uh, and Rob Jacobson running camera. And we're going to have a part two next week. This rabbit hole goes very, very deep. Uh, the fact that most Austinites don't even know that bioweapons are being developed in Austin that if they got out would kill over 90% of the people, things like mouse pox, things like airborne Ebola. The fact that uh, we've got an old reactor still operating hidden underneath UT downtown and then two up north and you tell the average person and they laugh at you and there's almost no news coverage. You have to go back to the 80s to even find Austin American Statesman articles on this. This is wild. So here's the report. Aaron Dykes here for Infowars.com. We're here on the UT campus in downtown Austin to expose some of the secret infrastructure that goes on at universities. Right here in Austin, Texas, there are several nuclear facilities. One is reportedly underground this campus. There's another at the J.J. Pickle Research Facility, part of the larger Austin system, just a few miles north of downtown here in Austin, Texas. Now, I'm standing here with one of our newest production team members, Christopher Oden, and not only is he a long-term Austin resident, his grandfather used to be a superintendent right here on UT campus. Christopher, tell us what you know. I do know that for a number of years, um, according to my great-grandfather, uh, Benjamin Ellis, uh, there was research conducted here that was not only kept uh, under great security and great secrecy, um, it was done by other agencies than just the University of Texas. Uh, I know that not only is there a nuclear reactor approximately six stories beneath our feet and the facilities to maintain such a reactor, there are a number of them, uh, at least one, possibly two, at the Pickle Research Center uh, about 15 miles north of here, um, as well as various locations in local caves within Travis County. Right here at J.J. Pickle, there's actually a nuclear reactor, a full-scale nuclear system going on behind research facilities, bio labs, and other regular university functions that are going on. 
and we want to know why is this being covered up, why is it not talked about. We have footage we're going to show you of some of the cooling towers and on Google Earth you can see some of the cooling ponds that are used for nuclear reactors. On June 13, 2012, there was an explosion at another research facility, which really just raises bigger questions about a lot of the secretive and often dangerous research that goes on under the auspices of university education. The um, University of Texas has been much less than transparent about a lot of their activities. Um, they have nanotechnology projects that uh, are published but uh, they've been very, very hush-hush about their nuclear reactor work. We do know across the country, uh, approximately 48 out of 64 nuclear reactor locations are admittedly leaking, admittedly rotting. They're leaking the radioactive element tritium into water supplies. That's all in MSNBC and other mainstream sources. So we know there's something going on. We know nuclear is not as clean as we were once convinced it was. And so the idea that something even more covert could be going on with dumping this material is certainly alarming. We're here at a location in a ravine just off of the Tom Miller Dam south of the Colorado River here in Austin. And CJ here will explain what our sources told us. My great grandfather did tell me that the University of Texas was using this area to dispose of nuclear waste. As we learn more about the disturbing nuclear secrets of Austin, and its threats to the environment, we began to understand how little we really know about what's going on in government and the world we live in. This is Aaron Dykes for InfoWars.com, signing off. And we will continue to bring you more coverage on that story as it unfolds. Meanwhile, we have learned that the CDC Bioterror Lab in Atlanta has had, had some serious problems with the airflow systems that they designed to stop the release of infectious agents. This revealed in government documents and internal emails. And this is the area of the building where they store anthrax. They have dangerous strains of influenza stored there monkeypox, you name it. These are microbes that have the potential to be used as bioweapons. And if any of these microbes were to get released on accident, let's say through one of those faulty ventilation systems, then there is seriously a potential for a global pandemic. It is that serious. And are there bioweapons labs in your neighborhood? InfoWars Nightly News investigates. Government-funded universities across the Western world are developing massive warehouses full of bioweapons that they say is for biodefense under the BioShield program. Airborne Ebola, smallpox, bubonic plague, bird flu, and the H1N1 superbug are being weaponized and kept in moderately secured facilities like at the Galveston National Laboratory on the campus of the University of Texas. Now this may be one of the biggest threats we now face as the risk of a deadly virus escaping one of these laboratories and starting a global pandemic, well it is a clear and present danger. Weaponized airborne Ebola, super weaponized viruses and bacteria that kill over 90%, nine out of 10 people on your street dead. The National Research Council, which is an arm of the National Academy of Sciences, released a report concerning potential hazardous risk associated with the new multi-million dollar infectious disease research lab currently under construction in Kansas. It's located only 120 miles west of Kansas City. It's called the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility. And even though it's a level four bio lab, which is the highest secured rating issued by the CDC, the expert panel found that there is nearly a 70% chance that a disease will escape the laboratory during its planned 50-year operational lifespan. And it went on to say that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has not adequately gauged the potential risk of a dangerous airborne pathogen escaping the compound. There are bio, what they call bioweapons that are in unsecured, well, moderately secured environments like in Galveston, Texas, and the CDC even went to one of these facilities in um, Kansas, and they're not as nearly as safe as they would hope. 
And they even said, the CDC even said the one in Kansas has a 70% chance of some dangerous virus getting released. I mean, what, so. what, what are the bylaws in keeping them safe? I don't think there's anything even designated to making sure that they're safe. It's such an, it's, it's that gray area of the world that nobody really thinks about, but, but is. Yes. Like, so you think it's a clear and present danger that we should try to prepare for or something like I mean, that? I think everybody should should always be prepared for anything. You know, it's like hope for the best, prepare for the worst. That's right. Can you imagine the awakening that's going to happen if they release those bioweapons? After we've warned people so much, God Almighty, I hope the next phases of what we've broken down don't happen. God Almighty, I hope they don't. But I know one thing, I'm sure selfish. I've sure gotten my family ready. Do you think it's wise for people that collect food and they have stockpiles of food and stuff like that just in case of emergency and have a place to go just in case something like this were to happen? I don't have anything stockpiled. I'm all about having weapons. I'm all about um, getting as much ammunition as you can get, getting it because everybody's going to get crazy. They're going to they're gonna want to get their hands on whatever sources are available, food, water, natural resources, anything to keep the, the normalcy of life continuing. That's why I'm out here on the streets. I want to like learn like some street smarts so and like if, if it goes down then I want to be able to like find your way around it. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something. Once that something like that goes down, the people in the high-rise apartments and stuff, they're not going to know what to do. It's, no, the, it's the people with street they smarts. Able, are gonna they be won't the be able to survive. survive. Just making sure that you have the resources that you need because when the world gets chaotic, everybody loses their minds. Let me put this in layman terms. A level four bioweapons lab should be three floors under the ground, barbed wire fences, minefields, and machine guns, and a system that if the super germs get out, they pull a lever, alarms go off, and the whole place goes up in flames. But instead, the global elite are storing it in level two facilities like the University of Texas at Galveston behind a glass door with a swipe card right there in petri dishes. And they're doing this so that when they release it to massively reduce population, they can claim it was an accident. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be joined by Rosalind Peterson of the Agriculture Defense Coalition, and we're going to talk about the total invasion of unmanned drones over U.S. airspace. It's the rise of the spy drones, up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. And, you know, if the feds in the military-industrial complex and the police agencies across the country get their way, and it looks like they're going to, unmanned drones are going to be flying en masse over every region of the United States. In fact, Congress recently passed legislation that's basically paving the way for what the FAA predicts will be somewhere in the range of 30,000 drones in operation over U.S. skies by the year 2020. You could bet your lucky stars that once the Pentagon gets a hold of these drones, they will use 
these drones to monitor the activities of the American people. And that brings us to our guest, Rosalind Peterson, joins us now from the Agriculture Defense Coalition, and that is a watchdog group that monitors uncontrolled experimental weather modification programs, geoengineering, and now the increasing activity of unmanned drones over U.S. airspace. And Rosalind, it's good to have you back with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and it's an honor to be here with you today. Well, th these drones are everywhere. They're, you know, private corporations have them, the military, police, homeland security. Should we be concerned? Oh, yes, definitely. We should be concerned about the drones and the proliferation because of the number, the scope, the size of the drones uh, from very large to very, very small handheld drones. And also the reason that we should be concerned is because the FAA is um, beginning to start to approve uh, drone testing ranges. They're beginning to approve um, uh, all kinds of people having drones within the United States, and that the air traffic controllers won't be able to see all of them. They won't be able to keep track of them, and they're going to become a danger for commercial airlines. They're going to become a danger for small planes that people have because they won't be able to see the drones, and a lot of times there won't be a way to avoid uh, when there's accidents, and we're already seeing that uh, right now. Well, that's right. We just saw just a couple days ago the global spy hawk crashed out there in Maryland, and that was a $176 million aircraft. A couple months ago, there was a drone near Houston actually crashed in the back of a SWAT team truck, and it crashed and burned then. And uh, we even heard about a spy drone that came close to causing a mid air collision with a jet over Denver, Colorado. So these things are dangerous. Oh, I think they're clearly dangerous. And also, uh, they're going to take money away from law enforcement because you're going to, instead of having people to help when there's um, crime being committed, they're going to tell you, well, no, I'm sorry, we can't send anybody, but we'll send a drone to circle around overhead while you're being robbed in your home. So this is another issue and all of the surveillance that's going to happen because you're talking about Homeland Security with drones, the FBI is going to have more drones, you're talking about all the government agencies, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Army are all engaged in having uh, drone ranges approved or expanded in not only Colorado and New Mexico but also in um, Oregon. Well, that's right. They're everywhere. And, and we also have some alarming news here that the U.S. is now developing plans to make nuclear drones. They want to increase the flying times from hours. Now they'll be able to stay up there for months. And, um, you know, they'll, of course, they'll have more power for their weapon systems as well. But now they have blueprints for new drones developed by the Sandia National Laboratories, defense contractor Northrop Grumman, and these will be nuclear drones. Tell us what you know about these. Well, this is something that the U.S. government is now starting to promote, is having these nuclear-powered drones. And the problem is that the military is already putting bombs on these drones. They're putting all kinds of um, missiles, different things that can, uh, that, you know, weapons. And we're buying parts for these uh, aircraft, all aircraft from China, though the parts are effective according to Senator Levin this past week. And so we're putting defective parts in these aircraft and they're going to, they're going to be a hazard if they, if they um, come down for any reason or hit something for any reason. And these things are not, um, you know, foolproof. They, they have accidents. And they're going to jeopardize the people of the United States because they're going to be carrying bombs. What happens when something goes wrong and these things crash, like the one in Maryland? Well, it sounds like the same mindset of the, the geniuses who decided to build nuclear power plants on, on major fault lines. So That's uh, exactly it. That's exactly it. And this looks like the way that they're moving. They're also using hydrogen drones, and these things are highly explosive as well. And so accidents are going to be happening, and you're going to have small drones who are going to hit larger ones. Sure, yeah, and it's, who's it's, going to keep track of all of these? 
Yeah, it's only a matter of time, but the more of these things they make up, you know, there's, there's, it's a potential for an accident. Hey, what about the drones that the Obama administration is establishing? I understand there's a fleet of drones in Africa under uh, African sitcom. So now we have UN or NATO armed drones in Africa. Tell us about those. Well, under the last NATO meeting that just occurred this past month, uh, what has happened is that the United States has agreed to arm NATO's drones, uh, give them all this equipment at taxpayers' expense, and for Africa South, Com, they're, they've got these drone ranges that they're, that they're putting up and that they're going to be using drones for surveillance. They're going to be using drones with weapons in countries that we have no war with at all, and we're going to be surveilling people, and there's no debate. There's no public discussion. And so when you're talking about drone ranges uh, in, so in um, South America as well, we're talking about putting them down there as well. Well, just who are we going to be um, putting under surveillance, and, and what is the intent here that we're going to be spending enormous sums of money to do this? And, and once again, we're the policemen of the world, and, and they say this is to fight al-Qaeda and to go after Coney. You know, but um, obviously this is just more expansion of the military-industrial complex and another chess piece on the grand chessboard. Well, it is, and also Northrop Grumman recently is lobbying Congress very heavily to sell drones for that they make for military purposes. They're lobbying to sell them for commercial use to other countries, and it's not going to be long before everyone is going to have these drones, and it makes us all less safe. Well, sure. Hey, well, let's talk about the privacy issues here at home because there's, you know, obviously a big, big concern from privacy advocates. We reported in February that there was over 30 prominent watchdog groups that all band together and they petitioned the FAA demanding that they set rules and guidelines for these drones to protect our privacy and our safety. The American Civil Liberties Union, Bill of Rights, Defense Committee among these groups. But they... Uh, you know, they asked for the agency to disclose where the drones are, who is currently flying them, and the FAA just uh, refused to disclose the information. Then they were forced to use the Freedom of Information Act, which they also ignored until they were sued for ignoring the Freedom of Information Act. Why do you think it's so difficult to get the FAA to disclose these records? What's up with that? Well, they don't want to talk because uh, because of the agencies, the U.S. government agencies that are going to be flying the drones. They don't want to disclose that. They don't want to talk about the drones with the bombs and the drones that have are going to surveil us um, under um, highly questionable uh, surveillance tactics and cameras. They're going to be taking photographs. They, they're very sophisticated. And also, they have handheld drones now. There was recent photographs showing that you could put on a small handheld drone, you know, three foot by two feet or something like this. But anyway, the size of the small drones, they can arm it with a machine gun. They can put cameras on it. It can hover. They can look in your windows. They can record your conversations. There's even drones the size of your hand that can fly up and attach themselves to a window or to a car and, and uh, go around and... Uh, follow you wherever you drive, listen to your conversations. And so there's no way to restrict this because people can make them or you can buy them off your supermarket shelves now because they're selling these drones, radio-controlled drones, are easy to come by. And now we know which private companies and government entities that are flying over U.S. airspace. Because Let's take a look at the list here. We've got Raytheon, General Atomics, Honeywell, of course, DARPA, the FBI, the Department of Energy, your friends over at the Department of Agriculture, the home, you know, Homeland Security, of course, all branches of the military. This is quite a list. It's a tremendous list, and it's going to get larger because you've got univer uh, universities are on the list now. You've got everyone wanting to fly these drones, and you're going to have air traffic congestion beyond belief. And, and also in the Boardman Range in Oregon, which the United States Navy is now trying to expand to make it bigger, 
um, they're going to be flying these armed drones over that area, and they've hired private contractors to conduct uh, surveillance activities. And what about the EPA? They were caught sending drones, uh, they were spying on farmers in Nebraska and Iowa, so they're uh, you know, utilizing these drones as, as well. I mean, the EPA now has drones, if you can imagine that. Hey, what do you think about this? How about this for a privacy concern? Many of these drone operations will actually have the ability to link facial recognition technology to surveillance drones and patch the information over to government databases. I mean, that sounds like something straight out of the movie Minority Report. Absolutely. Um, and this, and, and see, this is where if you're outside, if you're demonstrating, if you're in your backyard sunbathing, I mean, there's going to be absolutely no privacy. We're going to become a police state, a surveilled police state. And this is why I question a recent poll which said, well, people approve of this. Well, the, the, the mantra is uh, from the people that make the drones, oh, well, they're going to help with firefighting and they're going to help with this or that. But I don't think that that's the real intent of the drone. I think that that's a cover for the real intent is to make us into a, uh, you know, a surveillance state, a police state. Well, absolutely. And, and the drone industry is forced to launch a massive propaganda campaign because, you know, Americans, we're now being bombarded with these slick and, and positive images of the, of the technology. But I've even got a quote here from Michael Toscano. He's the president of the Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. He told Salon Magazine that because there is a growing perception that drones are a threat to privacy and safety, that they plan on responding by repeating good words. This is his quote, you have to keep repeating good words. He added that the word drones is going to be replaced with the term remotely piloted vehicles. Now, that sounds harmless. Or unmanned vehicles is what they've been using. Yeah. Yes, but but they don't tell you they don't they aren't going to tell you who's doing this and why why they're up there and what they're doing. And with the state of cameras, with the state of um, our ability to um, see what's going on on the ground, follow people around GPS. I mean, this is this is a this is the door to a police state. I really believe personally. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, in closing, because we're running out of time, uh, we only have a short amount of time here tonight. In closing, what, what kind of warning uh, to other people? What are we doing to tell people about these drones that they may not be for our protection? How do we get the word out to everyone that this could very well be the establishment of a police state right here in the United States? Well, I think that the first thing we have to do is make the information available, which um, I have put on my website, for example, agriculturedefensecoalition.org. I have a war cost drone section up uh, with a lot of the available technology, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army drone ranges where they want to take over um, land that's owned by real people now in order to make drone ranges. And this is um, something that we have to know about, and we have to start educating people that there's other intent with this, and that the number and scope is so tremendous that most people have no idea. Well, absolutely, Rosalind. Well, again, thank you for joining us. It was good to have you back on the show again. I encourage everybody to go to agriculturedefensecoalition.org website. Wealth of information there and easily categorized. There's PDF files, there's videos, graphics. I actually went there the beginning of this week to do some research on geoengineering, and then I saw that you had like over 600 PDF files on unmanned drones. So I've been combing through that information ever since, and that's what actually got me to call you and, and ask you if you wanted to be on the show today. So check out the website. Thank you for joining us, Rosalind, and I guess we shall meet again in the near future. I'm sure we'll have you back on soon. Yes, and thank you for having me on the show. It's always an honor uh, to be a guest on the show. All right, thanks again. Thank you. All right, and, uh, you know, it just occurred to me that I forgot to mention that um, we're talking about the propaganda campaign to sell the public on drones. Look what Rob Jacobson brought me back from the Bilderberg meeting in Chantilly. These are Homeland Security trading cards. I kid you not. And um, 
Whoa, right off the get-go, we have a U.S. Predator. Wow. It says here it's for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And on the back, we have a phone number, kids, where you can report suspicious activity to Homeland Security. Well, I feel safer already. And here's a Guardian Predator. Whoa, they even have a Midnight Express Coastal Interceptor. I bet the Texas DPS would like to buy like six of these. They'd even pay, what do you think, Marcos? They'd pay like $600,000 for these, for each one? A piece. Did you get any of these? Um, I'll trade you. Do you have any, um, I'm, I'm actually looking for a Reaper drone. Do you have a Reaper drone? I'll tell you what, I'll give you two. Let me have you two for a Reaper. Oh, yeah, I got to have a Reaper drone. Thank you, sir. Oh, this is awesome. You rock. These are collector's editions, folks. Hey, the Reaper drone actually killed 50 people in one day in Pakistan, including a five-year-old girl. So definitely want to uh, hang on to these. Sorry, folks, I'm just being a little sarcastic, a little gallows humor. Obviously, there's nothing funny at all with unmanned drones equipped with Hellfire missiles killing innocent civilians in Pakistan or, for that matter, unmanned drones uh, taking away our right to privacy and uh, escalating the police state here at home. Um, that's going to do it for today, but we, uh, we have the quote of the day real quick. Let me just read this. This is from Ian Rand. Civ uh, excuse me. Civilization is the progress toward a society of privacy. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from men. And thank you, John Bound, for bringing that quote to uh, our attention. Hey, uh, before we go, if we do the document cam one more time, this was sent to me by uh, a friend of mine who knew we were going to be covering drones. Here's a little tiny helicopter, and here's one. It's a little bird. These are all being developed right now. In fact, I saw one today. You might want to look it up or Google it uh, if you guys have time in the future, those of you at home. It's a, uh, a drone the size of a mosquito. I am not kidding. And that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. Be sure to join us again tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. That's Texas time. And uh, we'll be back. I believe Alex Jones will be hosting tomorrow night. So come back and join us then. Until then, have a good night. And God bless you all.